Let's pray the prayer of nation together. Together. O oh, wisdom divine, just as you inspire the mothers of our faith, grant us your knowledge and discernment so that we can learn how to be clever in our compassion and courageous in our faith. Through Jesus Christ and in the Spirit. Amen. Please welcome Pastor Zhehui for the sermon. Please be seated. I want to thank Anthony for leading us in a time of worship in music, and we continue in our worship in the listening to God's Word. Uh, firstly, we do want to extend our condolences to our uh, supposed, or rather our arranged guest preacher for today, Dr. Cha Fang Fung, uh, because her beloved father has gone to be with the Lord, and the funeral is today, uh, and so we want to uh, keep her in prayer and pray that God's comfort be upon her family as well. Um, Pastor Ming is also away. Uh, she's preaching at Trinity Methodist Church today, and just as the Lord is here with us, speaking to us, uh, we uh, trust that the Lord is also speaking to her, to our brothers and sisters in Trinity Methodist Church. Uh, well, today we come into the sermon, and uh, I've entitled today's sermon, Jesus and His Mother, and we will be uh, reflecting on John chapter 19, verses 25, uh, typo error, 25 to 27. Um, Will you hear now the word of the Lord? <clears throat> Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's sermon will take the form of three reflections on this scripture passage, and uh, we hope to hear from it uh, three things. Uh, firstly, a word for mothers. Secondly, a word for children. And thirdly, a word for the church. And so in our first reflection, a word for mothers. Now as we reflect on the passage that we have just read, standing by the cross of Jesus was his mother. How agonizing it is for a mother to witness the humiliation, pain, and death of a child. And this is surely not what any mothers dream of or anticipate when they first come to know that they are pregnant. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, was the same. If we put aside the conundrum of being told by an angel that she will conceive a son as a virgin and all the difficulties that that will um, possibly bring about, when Mary heard that she was going to be with child, she was in awe of all the angels said of the son she was to have. The angel said, you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the most high God. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. These are awesome things being said of the son that she was going to have. And how often when we find that a mother is pregnant, the things that were, are being said to her, the blessings poured out on the child that she's going to have, such things bring such hope and such visions, such lofty visions for the child that she's going to have. Mary praised God for the gift of her child. She envisioned great things that her child would accomplish and represent. And when she gave birth, she held the infant Jesus in her arms and she heard again the blessings and praises of people who came to visit the shepherds, the magi, and later on when she presented her child in the temple, uh, Simon and Anna, they would say such things, such amazing things about her child. And Mary treasured up all these things in her heart. She pondered about what they could mean, and she held out high hopes for him. And any parent would want to have high hopes for their children. But who would imagine that all her hopes would be dashed? And the only greatness that she now saw was the greatness in her dying son. The greatness of his tragedy, the greatness of his suffering, the greatness of his shame. And now we look at this story and we, you know, sometimes we, we really appreciate the thing that Jesus has done for us and we look to that moment, we look to the cross and we can see 
and draw comfort that Jesus loved us so much that he would die for us. But if you were in the shoes of Mary at that very moment, she had not yet understood the great thing that God was accomplishing through Jesus' crucifixion. The cross was not going to be for her a comfort. The cross for her was going to be pain. And she had to endure the pain of losing her son so tragically without the comfort that we today draw by looking at the cross of Jesus. And so in this very scene, as Mary, the mother of Jesus, was looking up to Jesus on the cross, we see the greatness and the weightiness of God's call to a woman to be a mother. And the call to motherhood is not a call to an easy life. It is not a call to a happy old age with children to provide for you. It is not a call to have your dreams and ambitions fulfilled. It is not a call to self-realization or feeling complete as a woman in having a child. Yes, these things do accompany many women who receive motherhood, but many mothers will also tell you differently. They will tell you of children who don't do as well as they hope for in school or in, in, in their work. They will tell you of children who don't enter professions that they dreamt of for them to enter. They will tell you of children who talk back to them and quarrel with them and cause them much angst. They will tell you of children who will not take care of them in their old age, nor even talk to them or spend time with them. Very sadly, some will also tell you that they became mothers from the foolishness of underaged or premarital sex, or they became mothers from the evil of sex trafficking or rape. If happiness, security, ambition, and self-realization are the goals, or if these things are how we perceive motherhood, then disappointment, disillusionment, and disaster awaits. But these things are not the point of being a mother. They are just accidentals. And we need to ask, what does motherhood properly mean? And in Christianity, Mary, as the mother of Jesus, stands as a symbol of what motherhood in light of the call of God is. Just as various biblical characters like Abraham, Moses, Ruth, David, Paul, they stand as heroes of faith and we learn from them as special examples, it is the same with Mary. And as we reflect on the life of Mary, we find that motherhood, in short, is a call to be a particular servant of God. After Mary was told that she will conceive a child, she concluded, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your, referring to the angel's word. I am the servant of the Lord. Now, our normal circumstances are of course different. Most women did not and will not have an angel telling you that you will become pregnant with the divine son of God. But when we realize that God is the ultimate giver of life and it is God alone who appoints when and who to conceive life through, then however a woman conceives, the moment that she conceives, she has become a mother. She has been given the call to be a mother. The question she must now answer is not whether she will be a mother or not, she already is. The question she needs to answer is what kind of mother will she be? Now, this sermon is not going to be a sermon on tips and advice on parenting or mothering, but it is a sermon to help us to realize how high, how great, and how weighty the call from God to be a mother is. And in so doing, to help us to affirm and honor all who have taken up that call. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And for all who have committed themselves to be good mothers in light of God's call, motherhood is one such cross that they take up. Now, some people may feel that, well, motherhood is a cross, but it is a cross that I did not choose to take up. It was put on me. But really, for all of you who have not put down that cross that, has been, that you feel has been put on you, for all of you who have not walked away from motherhood, walking away whether through disowning a difficult child or distancing yourself from a child that you can't stand, walking away from motherhood through aborting an unwanted or unpreferred child, 
if you have not walked away from motherhood, then you are making the daily decision to take up your cross to follow Christ. Because being a mother in light of God's call means that you will deny yourself of happiness, of comfort, of security, and personal ambitions. You will deny all these things to do your part to fulfill God's will for your child. And Mary stands as an example of such a mother. We call Mary blessed today for being the favoured one of God and praise God for the miracle of a virgin conception. Through it, we, we have this familiar and uh, such uplifting verse in the Bible. With God, all things are pos possible. Nothing is impossible with, with God. And that came from the virgin conception. But if you were Mary, especially in those days, you will face the risk of stigma, humiliation, and even stoning for becoming pregnant apart from a legitimate husband. Who would believe you? Who would believe your story that you were conceived as a virgin by the Holy Spirit? It's ridiculous. And so you would face the risk of stigma, humiliation, and even stoning. But Mary did not reject that cross. She accepted the call of God to be a mother. She bore that risk for God. She bore that risk for her child. And even as she bore this cross of carrying a child and becoming a mother, sometimes we might think that Mary had it easy. If anybody had a son like Jesus, life would be great and easy, right? Well, it seems that Jesus caused a little bit of anxiety and angst to Mary as well. We remember the time when he was 12 years old and Mary brought him to the temple. Mary and Joseph brought him to the temple. Um, and then... After a few days, they started their journey back home. It was a few days' journey back to Nazareth from Jerusalem. And they thought, Mary and Joseph, they thought that Jesus was with one of their relatives. Um, I'm imagining here, I'm reading a lot into text, so don't take this as a biblical truth, but just thinking about it, maybe Jesus was really uh, just a little bit talkative as a child, and they were like, it's okay, you, you just be with your relatives. And so they're happy going off alone. Well, after a few days, they realized, hey, Jesus is not with them in the traveling group. He was not with their relatives. And so they began to panic, and they went back all the way to the temple in Jerusalem to find Jesus. And there they found Jesus sitting with the teachers and the elders in the temple, having talks with them and and they saw that the teachers and elders were amazed at all that he was um, answering their questions and how, what, what understanding he held, and they were just amazed. If you were parents, when you first see Jesus, uh, my guess is your first thought would not be, whoa, I'm so proud of my son. The teachers and elders are, are so amazed at him. Your first thought would be this stupid son. Like, doesn't he know how worried we are? And so Mary told Jesus, don't you know how worried we were for you, for your safety? And then Jesus came back with a smart alec answer, don't you know I have to be in my father's house? I mean, today we look at it and we are saying, wow, that's a divine revelation. This is the true identity of God, that he is the son of God the Father. But you put yourself in Mary's shoes. Would you respond that way to your son who tell you, don't you know I have to be in my father's house when you are so worried about him? You'll be filled with angst, anxiety, frustration, perhaps. Well, we do know that whatever Jesus did, uh, he did not sin, right? Uh, scripture affirms us very clearly of that. He was tempted just as we are, but he was without sin. But even without sinning, it is possible to cause angst and anxiety in this fallen world. Uh, and that's... What happened? I wonder if sometimes as mothers or even as parents, we feel the angst and anxieties from our children. Uh, when they ask us such questions like, Mommy, how come we are not going to church today? It is a Sunday. Daddy, how come we are still uh, watching the service online? How come we are not coming to church in person? Mommy, can we have dinner tonight? It's been a long time since we have dinner. 
Daddy, how come you keep comparing me to the other person? And when they ask these questions, we are filled with angst. But then if we are honest and we think about it, this is the cross that we are called to carry as well. To deal with unreasonable and nonsensical questions from our children. But also sometimes, sometimes to have to carry the weight of being corrected by them. Because the questions that were asked, were, I mean, they could be asked in a rude way, they could be asked as unreasonable demands from a spoiled child. And if that is so, then the child needs to be corrected and disciplined. But sometimes taking a step back and you consider these questions, why do they frustrate us so much? They frustrate us so much. These innocent and pure questions from children frustrate us so much because they call into question the values that we hold. And we come to realize that the way that we have been living has been out of sync with God and His priorities. From just a few simple questions from children. And so carrying the weight of the cross, denying ourselves, would also mean sometimes listening to our children, tolerating the kind of anxiety and angst that they bring, but also sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes being corrected by them, or hearing what God is saying through them as well. But that's not all the cross that a mother has to bear. Here we see in our scripture reading today that Mary would have this cross to bear, very painfully. She had to endure the pain of a mother seeing her beloved son crucified, gasping in pain for every breath and finally dying. And against all comprehension, that was the way that God was working out His good and perfect will to save the world. And you know what? God has not given up saving the world. And mothers, He is going to call your children to play a part in His plan of salvation. Yes, some of your children may be called to be doctors or lawyers, architects, some great businessmen or whatever respectable and well-paying profession that you can think of. But perhaps, perhaps against our preferences, some are going to be called to be missionaries. Some are going to be called to be pastors or to be church workers. Not always respectable, safe or well-paying vocations, at least not in the sight of the world. Some may end up dying in the line of duty. And mothers must grapple with the question, whatever it may be, will I seek God's will for my children and will I do my part to prepare them for it? Some children may live with some sort of disability or debilitating illness because in some invisible way, that is how God is going to speak to the hearts of others that cannot be reached in other ways. Some may have to go away from God and away from you for a long period of time before they will repent and return. And mothers, you bear that uncomfortable, even painful cross, denying yourselves daily, denying yourself so that you do not impose your wills and preferences for your child over the will of God for them. And mothers, being servants of God, as you deny yourselves and take up your cross daily and follow Christ, you are called to a noble and high call of motherhood. And our prayer is that may you enjoy your children as blessings from God. But in the pains of mothering, may you find that God's grace is sufficient for you. May you find that His strength is made perfect in your weakness. And to all who have committed yourselves being mothers as servants of God, this is the word of the Lord to you today. Well done, good and faithful servant. We go on to our second reflection, a word for children. We recall in our passage, when Jesus saw his mother and a disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. 
And he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. It is so easy and perhaps something that can be excused. If you are in pain and you are in suffering, you think only for yourself and you have no bandwidth or capacity to think of others. Here was Jesus hanging on the cross, gasping in pain, his own pain, but in his own agony and in his dying moments, Jesus' thoughts were not for himself. He looked down, he saw his mother and his beloved disciple, and Jesus cared for his mother. He saw to it that beyond his death, his mother would be taken care of in her earthly life. He entrusted the mother to his, one of his most trusted disciple and beloved disciple, we think it's John. And he told them, take care of one another. But for today, we want to focus on the fact that he said to John, take care of my mother. And the disciple did. And the word for us as children from this scene is these one, two, three, four, five words. Honour your father and mother. If we talk about the clear commands of God that is repeated in the Bible, uh, this is perhaps one of the most repeated ones. It's repeated eight times in the Old Testament and New Testament put together. Honour your father and mother. Honour your father and mother. And that means to care for them, to care for their welfare, to spend time with them, to speak kindly to them, to speak respectfully to them, even if you have to disagree with them sometimes, it does not give you the right to be rude to them. And today, from this passage, if we will see that Jesus in his dying moments would care for his mother, then we who call ourselves Christians, will need to care for our parents, we will need to care for our mothers. Let us do so. It is painful sometimes to hear. And in my years as a pastor, I've come across mothers who have shared with me the pains of not being cared for or loved by their children. I remember a mother who, well, no mothers are perfect. She has made her fair share of mistakes. But as she talks about her son, you can feel the pain because the son would not even call her mother. He hates her so much that he only addresses her by her first name. The only time that he will talk to her is to ask her for money, no matter how much she has given him. And in his fits of anger, he would call her names. He would call her, I don't think I can say it here, but a female dog. He would curse her. And she would tell him, until you apologize, I'm not going to talk to you ever again. And he would apologize. After a long time, when he has run out of money, and apologizing is the only way he can get money. The sad thing is that this person, this son, calls himself a Christian. And if we are such children, the word of the Lord is repent, care for your mother. And if you persist in doing, going this way, Jesus has a very strong word. There was a time when Jesus was talking to a group of Pharisees and he rebuked them. He told them, you know, whenever you tell people that to tell their parents, whatever you would have received from me, uh, actually, I have given to God. Then you deprive the people from caring for their, for their uh, parents. And by your traditions, you have caused them to break the law of honouring their mothers and fathers. And he called them this, you hypocrites. 
And you know, Christians, if we do not honour our parents, will you hear this word of the Lord, you hypocrite? And that's a word that I need to hear for myself as well. There are times when I have not spoken very kindly to my mother, and I have to apologise. I have to say, sorry, mum, that time when I spoke to you, it was really out of place. But we need to honour our fathers and mothers. This is the way of Christ. In his own agony, he cared for them. And if we think, if we are those who belong to the group that think that, well, what to do? My mother is always in the wrong and um, my parents, they, they are of the older generation, things have changed and you know, I know so much more than them and all that stuff. Well, no matter how knowledgeable, how wise, how successful you are, you will never reach the level of Jesus. And it is written that Jesus, despite being the Son of God, Jesus who astounded the teachers and elders of his time, with his understanding, his knowledge, his wisdom, his way of thinking. Even this Jesus, the divine Son of God, was said to be submissive to his parents. And to be submissive meant to obey what they said, to, again, be kind to them, to be respectful to them. And we see in the life of Jesus, finally, taking care of them to the very end. And so let us hear this word and let us see the love of Jesus has for his mother, the example that he shows to us to honour our parents. And children, let us do so. Because as Paul reminds us in Scripture, this is the first and only command in the Ten Commandments that is accompanied by a promise. Will you honour your father and mother? A third reflection, a word for the church. Many theologians, many Christian thinkers have looked at this scene of Jesus saying, behold your son and behold your mother and entrusting the care of uh, the mother to John and John to the mother uh, as a symbol, a symbol of how Jesus was instituting a new family a new family of God in Christ, where people who were once not related by blood, they are now brought together by His blood, and they are called to love one another, to love one another as a new family of God in Christ. And the church, if you'll see it, is a new family. We are a family. We call one another brothers and sisters. We call God our Father in heaven. We call Jesus our older brother. And we are called to love one another. And today especially, perhaps we want to highlight that the church as a family means we are also to care for mothers, especially those who are in trouble. We look at this scene and we realise that Mary was going to be, by then she was a widow, she had some children left, but Jesus would still ensure that she was taken care of by his disciple. And so Jesus would entrust the care of mothers who are in trouble to the church. If we would find them among us and they need help, we must help them. Mothering is painful and difficult as it is. Mothers with special circumstances face even more difficulty. We think of single and widowed mothers who have to bring up their children with a single income. We think of mothers who have been abandoned by the children. We think of mothers whose children have died. Mothers who require the comfort, the encouragement, and the support of the church. If their families can take care of them, yes, the families should take care of them, but in the cases where the families cannot, Scripture is very clear that the church must take care of them. And we pray that in this church, mothers who are in trouble will find help. But even as we are called to be a church, to love one another, we are also called to love the church as our mother. 
Cyprian of Carthage is uh, a bishop in the third century, and during his time as bishop, he had to deal with uh, controversy in the church. There were Christians who had written, um, who, who were under persecution. They were forced to sign letters to deny their faith, and often they were made to do that under duress. There were threats made to their family members. It was not threat to themselves. It was threat that if you don't sign this, I'm going to do this to your wife or your or your daughter, or whatever. And so under duress, they signed a letter denying their faith in Jesus. Well, that period passed, and there was a period of peace in the church, and a decision had to be made. These Christians who signed and denied their faith, now in the time of peace, they want to come back to the church, they want to become Christians again. Do we allow them or not? Do we allow them back into the church or not? And there was a group of people led by this person called Novatian. And they were what we call today the purists. They said, no, they have denied the faith. They have committed apostasy. They cannot be allowed back into the church. God may forgive them, but the church has no authority to forgive such a sin. And so they cannot be welcomed back into the church. Cyprian led the other faction that said, no, God's grace is sufficient. If these people will repent, and these people show genuine signs of repentance with acts of penance and so on and so forth, we should welcome back into the church. We should. And so this purist led by Novation decided that we cannot be part of such a corrupt church. And so they said, we will split away. And Cyprian wrote this letter on the unity of the church to say, no, please don't split away. When you split away, you cause division in the church. When you cause division in the church, it harms the church. And if you break away from the church, can you really call yourself a Christian? Because you have done harm to the body of Christ, to the family of God. And then he wrote this, about people who think that they can break away from the church, who think that they are better and they can break away from the historic church to form their own brand of Christianity. He wrote these words, he can no longer have God for his father who has not the church for his mother. He can no longer have God for his father who has not the church for his mother. In other words, you cannot properly call yourself a Christian if you do not love the church as your mother. And in that letter, he also describes the church as a mother in, in the, as, as a family that provides nourishment, as nurture for, our, for her children, and that's us. Because in the church, we feed on the Word of God. In the church, we find faith. In the church, we find encouragement. We find life-giving things. And that's what a mother gives to her children. But just as the church is that thing for us, just as the church serves as a mother, for us, then we are called to love the church as our mother, even as we love God as our father. And to love God as our mother means to seek her well-being, to contribute in ways that would ensure that she is healthy. We would do things that would promote peace in the church. We would do things that would build the unity of the church. And so on this day, let us also remember that just as Jesus has instituted the church, the church can be seen to be our mother, and let us love the church also as our mother. And so I offer you these three reflections for today, and I pray that they would be something for us to think about on this special day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your grace upon our lives. Thank you even for the grace of giving us mothers. We pray, O Lord, that not just today, but every day, mothers will receive your word of instruction and mothers will receive your word of encouragement and affirmation. And mothers will experience your joy and the joy of your presence with them daily as they take up their call from you to be mothers to the children that you have given to them. 
biological or spiritual. We ask, O oh Lord, that they will always find that your grace is sufficient for them. Thank you, O oh God, for our mothers. We pray for ourselves as children. We, Lord, we ask for forgiveness for the times when we have failed our mothers for the times when we have not been good children to them. Lord, forgive us. We pray that they will forgive us. And we pray, O oh God, that you will continually help us to be good children to our parents, to spend time with them, even to their old age, even when they might have sicknesses, or maybe they may even forget us. And it is so painful and difficult to care for them. We pray that you also give us the grace to do so. In such times, just as they have borne the cross for us, help us to bear the cross for them. We pray for ourselves as your church, that you help us to care for one another, especially those who are in trouble. Today, especially for mothers who are in trouble. We pray that the church will be for them a place of refuge, a place of help, a place of comfort, a place where they'll find hope and a future. And we pray that you also grant us grace to love the church that you have given to us as a mother, to nourish us and to build us up. Give us grace, O oh Lord, to care for the church's well-being to make her healthy, to promote peace within her, and to do all things to build unity. That the church may always be a witness of your kingdom of love, of joy, of peace. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Chu Hui, for your words of encouragement, solace. Church, please stand for the hymn of response.